everyone for joining us on this very special occasion. I want to thank uh, the Department of Medicine for supporting the fifth annual Mark Babiatsky Memorial Lecture, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to it. This is really a very special occasion uh, upon which we honor Mark's memory, and it's really wonderful to see all of you, even if virtually, again. And I want to spend a few minutes, as I do every year, remembering Mark and what, what he meant to us, and a special welcome to Mark's family as well. Uh, Mark uh, really came from tough circumstances, uh, grew up in the Bronx, uh, but he really rose to the top of everything that he took on. He uh, attended the Bronx High School of Science and then got his BA from Columbia and then his MD from Albert Einstein, where he graduated AOA. And then over the next four years, Mark completed his internal medicine residency and chief residency at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York, as it was then known. And Mark's impressive performance in residency was recognized by doctors Kurt Isselbacher and Daniel Podolsky, who recruited Mark to the GI fellowship program in the gastrointestinal unit at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And after his fellowship, Mark continued at MGH as a junior faculty member. In 1994, Mark returned to the Division of Gastroenterology at Mount Sinai and continued his laboratory research on mechanisms of mucosal repair and inflammatory bowel disease. And while he was successful in the laboratory, Mark really found his true calling as an educator, and he became Mount Sinai's most cherished and distinguished educator. Uh, Mark won numerous teaching awards at all levels of medical school and was known for mentoring medical students, residents, fellows, and postdoctoral scientists. In 2002, Mark became the Director of Internal Medicine Residency and Co-Program Director of the Internal Medicine and Pediatrics Residency and Vice Chair for Education in the Department of Medicine. For the ensuing eight years, he nurtured and promoted the careers of over 400 residents and fellows. His teaching rounds, affectionately known as Babiatsky rounds, were the highlight of the week for all interns and residents who knew they were going to walk away with clinical pearls and new insights into all types of disease processes. Mark earned a national reputation and recognition among internal medicine program directors and became the founder and director of the Education Research Consortium of Program Directors and working with the American College of Physicians as the member, as a member of the in-training exam and Education Research Committee as an ACP representative to the NIH's Genomics Consensus Conference on developing a blueprint for primary care education, education, physician education, and genomic medicine. Then in 2010, Mark became chair of the Samuel Bronfman Department of Medicine and Professor of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And in this capacity, he made an impact on the educational and research missions in the department, as well as on patient safety, quality improvement programs community and multicultural affairs, and faculty practice operations. In early 2014, he assumed new challenges as the chair of medicine at Monmouth Medical Center and St. Barnabas Medical Group South Region to develop systems for providing high quality and cost-effective care. Mark embodied the keenest doctoring skills and had an innate ability to mentor and guide trainees, had an effortless talent for teaching, and an enviable and incredibly accessible body of knowledge for medicine and life. What really distinguished Mark from so many other gifted scholars and educators in medicine was his caring, compassionate personality and his genuine interest in every person he met from student resident and fellow to patient, family, or friend. Everyone who knew Mark felt as though they had a unique and close personal connection to him. He really made everyone feel valued and important. He exuded optimism, warm humor, and friendliness to people of all walks of life. And in this way, he affected the lives of people in countless ways that he perhaps never fully knew. I know that Mark had a profound impact on me at really critical junctures of my life and career, and I know that I'm not alone in that. We are really all the better for having had him among us, and we all miss him deeply. So now in his memory, it is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce the fifth annual Mark Babiatsky MD lecturer, Dr. Juanita Merchant. Dr. Merchant is chief of the division of gastroenterology and hepatology within the Department of Medicine at the University of Arizona. She is also a professor of medicine and holds a joint appointment in the Department of Physiological Sciences. She's a native of LA and received her Bachelor of Science in Biology from Stanford and completed her MD and PhD in Cell Biology as part of the NIH-supported Medical Scientist Training Program at Yale. 
She completed her internal medicine residency at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and then a post-residency GI fellowship focusing on molecular biology in the famous Steve Brand Lab at MGH, where Mark also worked. Subsequently, she completed her clinical GI fellowship at UCLA. In 1991, she was recruited to the University of Michigan as an assistant professor where she held primary and secondary appointments in the departments of internal medicine and molecular and integrative physiology. And prior to her recruitment to the University of Arizona, she held the Marvin Pollard Chair in Gastrointestinal Sciences. As a molecular gastroenterologist, Dr. Merchant's primary research interests include transcriptional control mechanisms regulating cell growth and differentiation and microbial host interactions in the GI tract. She's published over 140 research publications and is the editor or co-editor of four books and multiple books chapters in GI physiology. She is currently an associate editor for multiple journals and she has remained continuously funded by the NIH for nearly 30 years. In 2014, she received the AGA's Research Mentor Award, uh, AGA's 2017 Distinguished Research Award, and in 2020, the AGA's Distinguished Mentor Award. She was also the 1998 recipient of the AGA's Funderburg Award in Gastric Cancer. Dr. Merchant is a member of nine professional associations, including uh, the very prestigious uh, American uh, Association of American Physicians and the American Society of Clinical Investigation. She was inducted into the National Academy of Medicine in 2008, and in 2017, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She currently serves as an elected member of the AAP Council and National Academy of Medicine Council. And she was recently named to the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research Scientific Advisory Council. Dr. Merchant exemplifies the very best of academic gastroenterology and was also a dear friend of Mark Babiatsky. Juanita, Dr. Merchant, thank you for joining us today to honor the memory of our, our friend, Mark Babiatsky. Thank you, Bruce. Um, I, you know, it's just a wonderful honor to be able to be here and um, remember Mark. Um, I just want to show, um, let's see, a picture of our time together. Um, Tim is in the picture too. Uh, Steve Brand is in the back. <clears throat> Here's Mark. Uh, and this is our uh, lab group. And uh, as I had shared earlier, we uh, fondly would uh, share memories of uh, Broadway shows, particularly uh, Fiddler on the Roof. And another picture here of Mark and um, the group. So um, I continue to have um, very you know, high regards for Mark and know he was an outstanding um, educator uh, and uh, uh, professor and teacher of um, the, the fellows and residents. So um, today I wanted to uh, talk about, uh, um, these are our learning objectives uh, to distinguish the unique characteristics of the proximal versus distal gastric cancer and to define the composition of the tumor immune microenvironment in gastric cancer and to demonstrate how phosphodiesterase modulate uh, the tumor microenvironment. So to start off uh, my talk, um, I just wanted to remind uh, the audience about the racial disparities in gastric adenocarcinoma or GAC. And this is taken from a, a nice review article in gastroenterology from last year in which the uh, upper part of the um, stomach uh, or the cardia, uh, the, there's a lower risk of um, cancer among Asian Americans, but higher incidence of um, cardiac cancer among um, uh, non-Hispanic white individuals. Whereas uh, cancer in the lower part of the stomach near um, the antrum, but also some, somewhat in the corpus, uh, usually initiated by helicobacter pylori, but also associated with high salt and nitrates, um, has a higher prevalence among uh, Asian, uh, those of Asian descent, but also uh, those that are uh, underrepresented minorities such as Hispanics or Blacks. And here in Arizona, I've come to appreciate the um, Native American population, particularly the Navajo, have about a fourfold higher incidence of gastric adenocarcinoma. <clears throat> So uh, you can think of gastric adenocarcinoma as a tale of two organs. And so um, 
the uh, lower part of the stomach, um, the uh, helicobacter initiated type of cancer tends to be the intestinal type. And unlike the diffuse type of gastric cancer, the intestinal type will transition through this uh, metaplastic stage. Uh, in humans, we usually think about intestinal metaplasia, but there's also, as you'll see in a few moments, we talk about SPIM that was initially uh, coined by uh, one of our members in the audience, Tim Wong and Jim Goldenring. Uh, and I wanna talk about um, how the role of hedgehog signaling in the uh, development of this uh, pre-neoplastic change um, in the course of leading to gastric cancer. And then um, to talk a little bit about how uh, the work that we've done in hedgehog signaling has helped us to understand some of the changes that are uh, ongoing in the, uh, I'll call it tissue microenvironment first, but eventually it does lead to creating a microenvironment that is ripe for the development of cancer. So uh, this paradigm uh, taken from um, uh, Correa, Playa Correa's um, uh, 1995 Lancet article is uh, summarized here, which chronic uh, gastritis leads to atrophy and then the uh, replacement of these cells that are lost, primarily the parietal and chief cells with the this mucus cell type called metaplasia. And then on to this usually signals that uh, the um, mucosa is responding to some type of injury or insult and then uh, takes the breaks off of the mucosa and leads eventually uh, to dysplasia and carcinoma. Of course, not uh, everyone who is infected with Helicobacter pylori um, will develop uh, metaplasia, atrophy, and carcinoma. Uh, and obviously, this takes uh, several years to develop, or several decades to develop in, in patients. But we use the, uh, this atrophy met metaplastic change as a tipping point um, in this course, leading from this chronic smoldering inflammatory process in the stomach to the development of cancer. So we began to look at um, hedgehog signaling uh, in the transition from chronic inflammation in the stomach, uh, typically triggered by helicobacter, um, to this tipping point um, or uh, metaplastic change. Because uh, in 2000, uh, there was an article that uh, looked at the knockout of sonic hedgehog, which is one of the ligands for the hedgehog signaling pathway. And that article indicated that uh, when you knock out hedgehog signaling, that um, there was that metaplasia developed. It turned out probably it wasn't metaplasia looking at the actual um, art, uh, article, but this is what they reported. But that is, is actually what was the impetus for us to start to ask the question, was hedgehog signaling involved in this transition from inflammation to metaplasia? So for those not familiar with the hedgehog signaling pathway, typically hedgehog, uh, the ligand is made in an epithelial cell. So in the stomach, interestingly, um, the stomach, uh, particularly the parietal cells make high levels of the ligand sonic hedgehog. And the receiving cell um, will have the receptor for hedgehog called patched. Patched holds a, another transmembrane receptor called smoothen in an inhibitory state. When the ligand engages the receptor, the transcription factor, which uh, basically sits in the cytoplasm, um, will then migrate to the nucleus and turn on a, a program of uh, different, uh, different um, hedgehog signaling uh, responding genes. So, one of the first questions that we asked are which cells express uh, the sonic hedgehog ligand? And this is work that is um, you know, uh, over a decade old, but um, it nicely shows here where uh, we uh, used a sonic hedgehog laxi, a reporter mouse that was developed by Alex Joyner. And uh, this is uh, the stain for when you incubate the stomach, um, of these mice with the uh, substrate for laxi, you can see that uh, most of the corpus turns blue, the antrum less so. And then one can use uh, different uh, markers for the different cell populations in the stomach 
to identify and show that pretty much all of the cells uh, do express the, the ligand, but in particular, the parietal cells shown here co-localized with uh, HKTPase uh, strongly expresses uh, the sonic hedgehog ligand. Um, so we, in those projects, we typically were looking at some of the, the natural physiology of the parietal cell, but I want to move on to asking the question, which cells actually responded to hedgehog signaling? And this work was carried out initially by uh, Mo El Zatari in my lab, in which we again uh, borrowed uh, the uh, reporter mice that were developed by Alex Joyner. And uh, Mo uh, infected these mice with, we typically use Helicobacter felis instead of pylori because we were more interested in generating a very um, aggressive inflammatory response, which we could um, do much um, you get a much uh, larger inflammatory response with felis and with pylori in the mouse. So Mo infected these mice and we looked at two time points. We looked at two months and then we looked at six months to see which cells were responding to hedgehog signaling. Uh, and so uh, the uh, Glee positive cells are here shown here in green, in which we actually use an antibody to detect the lag Z so that we could do co localization. And in the absence of uh, hedgehogs, um, or I'm sorry, in the absence of uh, Helicobacter infection, um, primarily the alpha smooth muscle positive cells or um, the uh, myofibroblasts tend to express um, the um, uh, Glee1. Uh, uh, transcription factor indicating that these cells are responding to sonic hedgehog. However, after two months of infection, so this would be more of the acute um, inflammatory period, one will notice that there are inflammatory cells that are starting to infiltrate the stomach and shown here in higher power. Interestingly, the uh, myofibroblast um, cells tend to turn off hedgehog signaling. We've actually never come back to look at that question of why the myofibroblast may actually downregulate um, the expression of GLE-1 and its ability to respond to hedgehog signaling. But you'll notice that these um, cells that are infiltrating the stomach, and we can use flow cytometry and co-localization to identify what those cells are. And of course, they turned out to be immune cells. And uh, when you look at the markers, uh, that they tend to be of the myeloid lineage. So um, in the, during the acute phase, therefore, um, there are, um, it's now known that the acute phase of the helicobacter infection is more of the pro-inflammatory stage in which the primary um, the cytokine response tends to be Th1 and Th17 and less so the uh, immune suppressive types of cell populations, the Th2, Tregs, uh, tumor-associated macrophages, or M2s. Um, but one will see that in the chronic phase that then those immune suppressor cell populations tend to take over. So one of the first questions that we wanted to ask in um, understanding um, what the role of the immune responding, um, uh, the, the immune cells that were responding to hedgehog signaling, um, since the way this mouse was set up, the LAXZ was knocked into the GLE-1 locus. So we could also ask the question, what was happening to the mucosa during the, uh, in the absence of this uh, GLE-1 signal? And we were actually surprised to find, uh, as shown here and was published in 2013, that um, what you see here, and I'm only showing the immunofluorescent um, uh, image of this, and I'll show later the H&E, but um, you can basically see uh, the what's called the uh, metaplastic change or spasmolytic polypeptide expressing metaplasia, which is the metaplastic change that we typically see in the mouse stomach when we infect with helicobacter chronically. And you can stain for this um, metaplastic change with this lectin, uh, called GS2, which is shown here in green. So also you'll see that the 
parietal cells, which are seen um, in orange for HKTPAs, you'll see them here on the side, as well as in the mouse, intrinsic factor stains the chief cell. So you can see here that there is loss in this region or atrophy of the parietal and chief cells and the replacement um, with this metaplastic change, which is called SPIM. However, in the mice that were maintained, so these are the GLE-1, LAC-Z, or just uh, for the shorthand, we just went ahead and um, called this uh, the G1, uh, GLE-1 uh, minus plus. So in the heterozygous or homozygous state, uh, the mice are fine, but you'll notice that they, uh, the architecture of the stomach uh, is unperturbed. So it suggested that something about the, we believe the immune cells that are responding to hedgehog signaling um, were important in the metaplastic change in the stomach. So this was our key finding that led to the subsequent experiments. So uh, the metaplastic change in the stomach uh, in the mice take, uh, occurs from, um, well, after two months, but we were able to narrow it down to between four and six months. And this, um, uh, uh, usually represents, um, we now know, uh, the recruitment of these immune suppressor types of uh, myeloid cells and inflammatory cells. And so uh, the question here is whether GLE-1 is important in the uh, polarization of the myeloid cells toward these uh, immune suppressor types of cells. And is it the presence of the, this type of microenvironment that allows the metaplastic changes to occur? So where we are at this point in time in the talk is that um, infecting mice for six months, uh, so the chronic inflammation, we see the metaplastic change. And if we knock out or uh, if GLE-1 is not around, then you, uh, one can block this atrophy to metaplastic step. So since um, GLE-1 is a trans transcription factor, we can basically use it to go fishing and identify um, what are its downstream targets. And so at the time we use microarray. And so this is basically uh, two mice per group, um, the wild type mice, and you see a set of genes that are turned on. And then in the GLE-1, uh, homozygous null mice, you can see that uh, a set of genes is, is um, not activated or turned off. And I have to admit, I'm not exactly sure why Mo at the time focused on Schlopp and four, but I'll just say that it has um, was a good choice. And so we started to ask the question, what was it about um, some of these downstream targets, particularly Schlopp and four, um, that was important in this transition. We did know at the time that uh, these Schlafen molecules um, are strongly induced by type one interferons, that was already known, and that the, the Schlafen locus is important in myeloid cell differentiation. So we um, use the microarray analysis to ident uh, identify downstream targets. We then um, use chromatin immunoprecipitation to demonstrate that Schlafen-4 was indeed a direct target and could sit on the promoter of Schlafen-4. So um, as I said, we essentially um, were looking at um, what were downstream targets of Glee. We decided to, to run with Schlafen-4. And so then to actually look at what was important about Schlafen-4, we then generated another mouse model um, to actually trace the cells that were um, expressing this particular um, uh, downstream direct target of GLE-1 and generated a back uh, Schlafen-4 promoter driving a, a Cree-ERT2 um, cDNA. We cross this mouse to a reporter mouse, which will express TD tomato so that we had these cells were very brightly labeled with um, the red fluorescent signal. <clears throat> And then we actually um, complicated matters by then so that we were only looking at the immune cell population uh, emerging from the bone marrow. Uh, the bone marrow from this uh, hybrid mouse was then transplanted into um, actually two different groups of mice. I'll start out with the wild type mouse because I'll introduce another uh, mouse model where we ended up goosing up 
the hedgehog signaling pathway by using a transgene to overexpress sonic hedgehog in the mouse. And that particular mouse, in addition to the wild type mouse, also received this bone marrow transplant. So we had two different groups of mice, one that were wild type and one with a higher sonic hedgehog signal. And we therefore used this setup to then follow these immune cells over time. <clears throat> And the reason why we use this sonic hedgehog overexpressing mouse is because what you'll see is that we were able to accelerate the development of the SPIM or metaplastic atrophic change. So here, um, comparing side by side the wild type and the sonic hedgehog overexpressing mouse, um, where you still see after two months, uh, relatively normal architecture of the uh, stomach with the parietal cells shown here, the sort of fried egg appearance. But you can see here that in the sonic hedgehog overexpressing mouse that you can already see a little bit more inflammation um, after the helicobacter infection. But then by four months, you clearly see very strong um, uh, appearance of the uh, uh, metaplastic change where you don't see it in the wild type mouse. And so uh, this four month time point becomes an important um, control point where we can use the wild type infected mouse and compare it to the sonic hedgehog overexpressing mouse where we can see um, the, uh, uh, the, the spin. But by six, excuse me, by six months, we do see the um, uh, wild type mouse does also um, develop the stem as shown here. <clears throat> so in this slide, um, what you'll see, and again, already published in 2016, when we compare the wild type mouse at four months infected with helicobacter, the uh, Schlopp and positive cells, which are TD tomato positive, so they're these bright red cells. You can see here where you see the metaplastic change um, in the uh, sonic hedgehog overexpressing mouse. You can see the Schlopp and for positive cells percolating up into the lamina propria. Here's a high power view, which you can then, the advantage of these cells being strongly fluorescently labeled is that we could sort these cells out and actually um, stain them um, to look at their uh, nuclear morphology. So they had more of a granulocytic nucleus, but we could also do additional analysis of um, using flow cytometry, their um, surface markers, and also do some biochemistry on them. Um, and they, uh, it turned out that they had the phenotype of myeloid-derived suppressor cells. They were both arginase uh, 1 and inose positive. In addition, we were able to um, uh, collect these cells and actually do T cell suppressor function, confirming that they did indeed have um, this um, a T cell suppressor function. <clears throat> In addition, um, as I mentioned earlier, the, um, this Schlafen locus is very strongly induced by type 1 interferons. And so we wanted to demonstrate that. So we uh, used these mice and actually generated um, a collection of myeloid cells by giving the mice <clears throat> do a peritoneal injection of thioglycolate, which will essentially cause a lot of pus in the, the abdomen. And we can collect those cells and actually do a little bit more biochemistry with, with a larger cohort of um, myeloid cells. And what you see here is that recombinant sonic hedgehog alone or H fetus alone did not strongly induce uh, the expression of sloth and four. But you'll see that the two together um, strongly stimulated the promoter, but just type one interferon, so interferon alpha, very strongly induces um, uh, the sloth and four promoter. And if you use the uh, cells collected from the GLE-1 null mice that this blocks this, uh, these inductions. So again, emphasizing again that um, this particular uh, gene and promoter was strongly induced by uh, type 1 interferons. And so um, using the chip assay, we had confirmed that indeed um, the Schlafen-4 promoter 
um, that GLE1 binds to uh, the distal part of the promoter. And what we believe is essentially a constitutive signal that this promoter is not active and that is not capable of really responding to type one interferons uh, unless hedgehog signaling is available. And, but that the inducible signal, which we believe is um, uh, in which uh, helicobacter can participate in this, um, eventually results in type 1 interferons or interferon alpha, and there's a whole set of transcription factors that are activated by this inducible signal and binds to the proximal part of the Schlafen promoter. So you need both of those keys engaged to see the maximal induction of this promoter. Um, so this then raised the question, well, what is the source of type 1 interferons in the infected stomach? And uh, it turns out that typically damage activated molecular patterns or damps, which are sensed by uh, toll-like receptor nine. So this is the endocytic um, type of toll-like receptor. And there's a whole series of cascading events that eventually will result in increase in uh, type one interferons, both interferon beta and interferon alpha. Uh, when we compare both side by side in the assay that I just showed you, interferon alpha tended to be a little bit stronger. So we tended to uh, use uh, type 1 interferon to activate these cells ex vivo. So to summarize essentially what I have um, just showed you is that chronic inflammation results in uh, the activation of these damage-activated uh, damage molecular patterns or DAMPs um, the typical ligands for DAMPs will be unmethylated CPG DNA, such as what you might find in Helicobacter pylori or even Helicobacter felis, but also um, mitochondrial DNA uh, tends to be some type of double-stranded DNA or um, uh, pr proteins that are related to chromatin. And those will induce toll-like receptor nine. There is a series of the, uh, cascading events that occur, which also include IRF7 that, and we, as I showed you earlier, type one interferon, particularly interferon alpha is then what turns on these, um, the Schlafen four. And so we've concluded that in general, um, it appears to be this particular pathway that polarizes the, uh, a certain subset of myeloid cells, not, I would say all MDSCs or all myeloid cells, but a particular subset that is expressing Schlafen 4. So um, again, that's summarizing. So again, this polarization of a myeloid cell under the control of type 1 interferons, these are some of the ligands and resulting in this uh, Schlafen 4 positive MDSC. It is the um, nitric oxide synthase or uh, uh, two or inducible uh, NOS and arginase that is responsible for the T cell suppress uh, suppressor activity. Uh, and this is well known and has been um, highly studied. I won't get into a lot of details about that. Um, this is actually a summary, essentially um, what myeloid derived suppressor cells, so these uh, immune cells that contain these two enzymes, they essentially um, uh, either participate in inhibiting the T cell receptor or they um, consume arginine so that the T cell cannot proliferate. So how does, T, um, how does helicobacter induce interferon alpha? And so we then moved on to ask the question um, by uh, flow sorting those TD tomato cells and performing RNA seq. So this is kind of we haven't quite. This is sort of a poor man's um, or poor woman's uh, um, single cell um, RNA seq type of analysis since we were able to isolate only these cells because of their tag. And um, in collaboration with the CURE group, um, performed the nanostring array as well as the RNA seq. And uh, the analysis, interestingly, of the uh, nanostring analysis identified um, a higher level of particularly one type of microRNA that was higher than in the stomach than in the uh, bone marrow of infected mice. 
but also um, higher than um, Schlafen, uh, Schlafen for uh, negative um, cells, which are basically the epithelial cells or non-immune cells in the stomach. We identify this MIR-130B. Um, what is MIR-130B? So it's a microRNA. And for those of you familiar with microRNAs, you know, there you can actually just go to target scan. You can go to a website and actually um, identify, which identifies the, the binding site. And then there's a whole list of genes, uh, which there you can see here, I'm only listing about a, um, uh, a few of them out of a thousand that um, this particular microRNA can bind to. But you'll notice that I've highlighted CYLD. And why did I highlight CYLD? So uh, it stands for cylindromatosis. And we went back to, um, to identify of the um, thousands of MIR-130 uh, MIR-130B genes that were possible that this um, MIR could bind to, we looked at, went back and looked at our um, RNA-seq and asked the question, which genes are suppressed um, in, those, in that cell population? So comparing um, the bone marrow of an infected mouse that uh, any TD tomato positive cells to the spleen and then in the stomach. And in the stomach is where we typically will see this polarization. And so we ask the question, what genes in this population were suppressed? And you'll see there are some other genes to study that we haven't come back to, but we particularly were interested in the CYLD gene, which was indeed suppressed. And it turns out that CYLD is a deubiquitinase. So normally it prevents um, the activation of the of NF kappa B by uh, preventing I kappa B from being ubiquitinated. So you can imagine that microRNAs, which tend to suppress genes, by binding to their three prime untranslated region, this actually turned off CYLD, which we could verify it was turning off or it was off in these particular cells. And so we anticipated that this should result in higher levels of NF kappa B. It turns out, and you can do it in silico, we actually looked also at the MIR 130B promoter. And indeed, um, the MIR 130B promoter also has um, uh, um, several binding sites for N of kappa B. So there's potential for this sort of feed forward mechanism um, for MIR 130B and for N of kappa B. And so we also asked the question whether um, N of kappa B was elevated in these cells. Indeed, it was to some extent. And <clears throat> we used a human um, myeloid cell line um, called HL60 to actually test the function of MIR-130B and show here, so using TNF-alpha as a strong activator of NF-kappa B, you can see here that it strongly stimulates NF-kappa B, that the mimic or the actual microRNA when transfected into these cells uh, alone also stimulated NF-kappa B, and that if you stimulate it with TNF-alpha and then knock down um, uh, MIR-130 using the SI RNA version that you could block that induction. So indeed, MIR-130B was involved in um, generating um, uh, NF-kappa B. So we wanted to look at this a little bit more in collaboration with Yana Zavros um, using xenograph models in which she had uh, generated um, organoids uh, from three different types of human gastric adenocarcinomas, uh, diffuse intestinal type and signet ring. Um, and so you can actually transfect um, molecules into um, cells that you can then regenerate into organoids. So essentially you break up the organoid, do the transfection and then uh, allow them to grow up and then generate xenografts in the flanks of mice. And we were, um, quite surprised um, to see that. So the sham injection, and this is using, um, this is a picture of the, the mice, of the flanks of the mice from uh, the uh, intestinal type of um, uh, organoid that 
when you inject the flanks of mice, you should get tumors in which we did that if those um, cells have been, if the organoids are transfected with the mimic, the MIR-130B mimic, we saw bigger tumors. But what we were really surprised to see is that if you knock down MIR-130B that you um, really don't see tumor development. Now we then, um, or Yana then quantified this for all three of the different groups. And you can see particularly this one, um, we can see over time, so this is over nine weeks, that there is a, you know, a little bit of tumors developed, but that compared to the mimic, that there is a significant difference if you use, if you overexpress MIR-130B versus um, the sham injection, which is um, the green, and then the antisense, which is shown in blue for all three of these different cell types. And this is actually looking at the levels of the MIR-130B which you can use um, a kit for in situ hybridization analysis um, in the tissue versus in the serum. So clearly in the tissue, uh, it was important. So we were able to then uh, micro dissect out some of these tumors to actually look to see whether inner kappa B was expressed. Uh, and this is an example from uh, the uh, organoid two, um, which was the intestinal type. So uh, here is the tumor here in the scramble stain for inner kappa B. So there is some staining uh, with the mimic, higher staining of inner kappa B, and then lower staining if you use the antisense. And then you can then do a Western blot to actually demonstrate that indeed with the mimic, as we predicted, you turn off CYLD with the antisense, CYLD comes back on. And this correlates with inner kappa B um, uh, observed in the nucleus. So um, to summarize all that work, which was published last year, um, you can see that um, essentially what we have worked out is that um, early on, there is actually, and this is work that uh, the Zavros group did, that um, sonic hedgehog um, produced from possibly damaged or leaky cells in the stomach, such as the parietal cells, um, help to the uh, immune cells to track to the stomach, but that over time and in the mouse model, it takes about um, four, four to six months that these cells will polarize, uh, we believe due to the accumulation of debris that develops from either the dying um, cells or debris from the helicobacter pylori. And those ligands will tend to increase in a, um, interferon alpha generated from plasma cytoid dendritic cells. I didn't have time to get into showing you that work, um, but that this then activates this uh, a set of myeloid cells um, that are able to express Schlafen. And those Schlafen um, for positive cells um, will also produce molecules that um, can either contribute to T cell suppressor function or we know from our RNA-seq analysis that they also will produce growth factors and also produce TNF-alpha. So we believe that these cells are important in contributing to the uh, um, uh, changes in the epithelium. So to actually demonstrate that, we recently uh, generated a, uh, a knockout of uh, conditional knockout of Schlafen 4 to actually ask the question whether um, Schlafen 4 is important in this metaplastic um, change. And so uh, here we um, generated um, a Schlafen 4 uh, flox mouse model cross that to, because we wanted to knock this out in the GLEE-1 cells, uh, and this mouse uh, actually already existed, so we bred these mice together um, so that, and then treated them with tamoxifen. So uh, only in the GLEE-1 positive cells is Schlafen uh, conditionally knocked out. We wanted, before we bred up a large group of mice, we wanted to make sure that indeed that this um, knockout, especially because we were foxing exon-1, um, was sufficient. And what you see here um, in this um, uh, graph is that um, this is in wild type or the sonic hedgehog overexpressing mouse, not infected, and then infected in which um, we are expecting higher levels of um, Schlafen 4 
in those mice that are overexpressing sound and catch-all compared to the wild type. So indeed our induction work. And if those um, mice are, um, uh, or if, if the um, conditional knockout with tamoxifen is bred to the, um, or is treated with a helicobacter felis that we block the induction of schlafen. So what happens to the mucosa? And so here is our timeline here. And uh, the results of that, um, uh, the treatment, uh, again, we were expecting, uh, and this is um, over six months, strong inflammatory changes and SPEM in the wild type and the sonic hedgehog overexpressing mouse. Um, however, um, if uh, you infect the uh, mice that are conditionally knocked out, ha uh, have schlafen for conditionally knocked out in the GLE-1 positive cells, that you see the restoration or um, you, uh, one blocks the uh, development of the metaplasia. Um, you can see the presence of the parietal cells. And I'll just show, and same thing with the uh, sonic hedgehog overexpressing mice. So it, it definitely mitigates the development of SPIM. And then if you do the immunofluorescent um, analysis, one can see the return of the parietal cells here in these uh, two mice in which Schlafen-4 has been knocked out. So it indeed appears that um, Schlafen-4 in presumably these immune cells are required for the SPIM development. So what is the connection of Schlafen to phosphodiesterases? And um, we actually, I, I probably have this a little out of order. There was an article that suggested that uh, one of the human Schlafen, Schlafen 12, actually formed a complex with phosphodiesterase 3. So we thought, well, maybe um, because Schlafen, when we wanted to do the knockout of Schlafen first to make sure that it seemed like uh, this particular molecule was important in uh, the development of this metaplasia. So could we come up with a pharmacologic way of blocking um, Schlafen's? That article then came out from the Boston group, from uh, Mark Myers' group. And so we then looked into a little bit more about the role of phosphodiesterases in the development of INOS or NOS2 is the other name for it. And so um, it turns out that, it, and we had already published this, that Schlafen for MDSCs by our RNA-seq make higher levels of this particular enzyme. And it turns out there's a very complicated um, biochemical enzymatic uh, reaction that is necessary to maintain INOS activity. And it requires guanylate uh, GTP conversion to cyclic GMP. That's important because, as you know, phosphodiesterases are important in the breakdown of cyclic nucleotides, either AMP or GMP. But in particular for inose, um, cyclic GMP is more important. So I'll kind of skip through all this. But um, there are, unfortunately, 11 different phosphodiesterases. So which ones were relevant? Um, it's, it is known which ones are uh, preferenti preferentially will break down cyclic GMP. And as I'll show you in the next slide, when we go back and mine our RNA-seq data, it turns out that um, five, which is the major one that people study, but 11 and six were in particularly high in Schlopp and four in our um, RNA-seq analysis. Um, it turns out that 11, um, there's not a lot known about 11, so that's why we haven't focused on it. It has dual specificity, um, but most importantly, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors known as Cialis or Viagra um, are known to block 5, but also can uh, block 6 and uh, prevent the breakdown of cyclic GMP. So here's our little... Um, Diagram, I kind of explained that ahead of time. So um, INOS or NOS2 uses arginine to generate nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is, it has some type of allosteric interaction with guanylate cyclase. Guanylate cyclase takes GTP to cyclic GMP and 
basically the phosphodiesterase inhibitors will inhibit this breakdown. So you know that these are working if there is um, uh, higher levels of cyclic GMP. When we reviewed our RNA-seq, so we could, you know, uh, I can tell you it's the gift that kept on giving, <clears throat> we found that um, it, there were a large number of um, guanylate binding proteins, GP2 in particular, and we're, I'm still trying to figure out and understand the biochemistry behind these, but essentially they are important in binding GT, <clears throat> excuse me, GTP. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we did see um, some um, uh, detection of um, uh, phosphodiesterase 5, but it was, um, we had higher levels of 6 and 11 in these particular cells. So one of the first things we wanted to know is if we gave the mice <clears throat> Viagra, um, whether um, we saw an increase in cyclic GMP, and we looked at both um, Gavage as well as IP injection. Um, we didn't see any changes in cyclic uh, AMP. Uh, and then in the uh, mice that were infected with Helicobacter, this, in this case for six months, we did see a little bit of a bump. So we thought maybe we were looking at um, certainly the right um, cohort of um, uh, phosphodiesterases. And then we performed the pharmacologic treatment of these um, helicobacter infected mice. Um, so again, this is a six month time course. And um, you know, we were essentially guessing in terms of the dosing of uh, sildenafil, which is Viagra. So we did an IP injection initially um, two weeks apart. Um, so each week, each of these weeks we do um, uh, three uh, injections in a series, wait two weeks, and then another three injections. And then we waited another two months to see uh, what the results were in terms of whether um, the pharmacologic treatment was able to um, uh, reverse the um, uh, metaplasia. And we also incubated sildenafil with helicobacter directly just to make sure that the drug wasn't killing off the, bac the bacteria, and that's why we saw the reversal. So here is the results of that pharmacologic treatment. And again, here, um, what you see is um, the, um, let's say, oh, here, uh, in this corner here, the uh, Sonic hedgehog overexpressing mice treated with Helicobacter felis showing the metaplasia. But then here, uh, treated with sildenafil using that protocol. And these are just two different groups of mice. You can see here, uh, nice uh, uh, replacement again of, I shouldn't say replay, but um, the parietal cells again are appearing. And it seems like we're starting to have resolution of the metaplastic change you'll know that there's still quite a bit of inflammation there, which is what we will be very interested to see whether this is also blocking the polarization. We haven't um, analyzed these immune cells yet. And then this is actually uh, looking at the histology using the uh, markers. So the GS2 lectin um, showing the strong SPIM uh, lineage here. And then in the presence of sildenafil, the return of the parietal cells. Um, so some of the things just to prove that indeed you do, um, that the uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitor is actually working in the tissue, uh, it turns out uh, that there is some evidence that in this article just came out last year, that phosphodiesterase inhibitors will um, also block um, inose uh, message, uh, mRNA. So this is the pathway that they proposed. Um, we haven't investigated all aspects of this, but we were interested in the fact that sildenafil could actually um, in, or decrease the levels of inos. And so we used our ability to study the immune cells um, using the, actually the TD tomato model by treating those mice with interferon alpha. And so what you'll see here, uh, this is the control, the TD tomato cells here, you'll see, you know, barely a little bit of red, nothing for um, inos. But then when you treat 
This, these are the peritoneal macrophages from this mouse. You can see we turn on the TD tomato signal, so turning on Schlafen, um, which co-localizes with inos in these peritoneal macrophages. But then if we treat um, these mice with sildenafil, you can see that we not only uh, dampen down the TD tomato signal, but also turn off ino. So what the uh, that paper was saying is correct that sildenafil indi indeed can inhibit inos, and you of course can follow that up um, with we took the um, RNA from the infected mice as well as protein shown here that inos in the uh, infected sonic hedgehog overexpressing mice do increase inos. And then in the schlop and knockout, as well as the sildenafil treated mice, that there is suppression of inos, and that can be confirmed also by looking at the protein levels. So this is my last slide. Um, so in general, um, we've been following a subset of myeloid derived suppressor cells that appear to be interferon alpha responsive, we use the Schlafen signal as a way to follow these cells. And because we have them fluorescently labeled, we can study them in more detail. Um, they have um, T cell suppressor function. They make a variety of different molecules, which I've listed here. But we now know that a variety of different inhibitors, so we can either delete Schlafen itself, um, uh, phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, can block the uh, expression and function of these cells. And in data that is in the gut paper that I didn't show you, you can actually treat these mice with the antisense version of mir 130 b and block um, their function and uh, the development of metaplasia. As I mentioned, I, we believe that the reason why these cells are important is that they produce a variety of molecules that can talk to the, meta, to the epithelium, and start to move the uh, stomach toward uh, metaplasia and eventually cancer. So I'd just like to acknowledge um, the major person that has led this work and moved with me from Michigan to um, Arizona, Lynn Ding, um, as well as our current group um, in work that um, I didn't have time to show um, where we use some retrospective studies and samples from China and uh, Hanoi, Vietnam, to actually uh, look at the levels of the MIR 130B. Uh, Mo El Zatari, uh, who's still at Michigan, uh, is uh, initially started this work. And of course, our collaborators um, at CURE, and then Yana Zavaros at University of Arizona. And I thank you for your attention and uh, thank you for the honor of being able to present my work here at um, Mark's um, in, in honor of Mark. Thank you. Juanita, thank you so much. That that was really incredible. Um, we're we're running out of time. My fault for a lengthy introduction, well deserved, <laughs> um, for you and for Mark. Uh, but I want to share um, what will be coming your way. I hope that everyone can see the beautiful oh, certificate beautiful. that will be coming to you to commemorate this lecture. And um, there there are. Just a few questions. We have time for one comment and one question. And I'll start with uh, Steve Bitzkowitz's comment, which uh, he wrote, uh, Mark also spoke Yiddish and the word schlafen in Yiddish means to sleep. Yes. And I'm sure Mark would have gotten a good laugh at that. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, oh, great. Very fitting for Mount Sinai. Yeah. And there's one, one question from uh, Dr. Milagros Greenberg, who is asking whether, um, uh, a lot of the findings that you showed were in mouse models, of course, um, or in organoids. So to what extent the changes that you show in the various factors, Schlafen and so on, um, have been cross-validated in biopsy specimens of human gastric cancer or metaplasia? So in the gut paper, we actually um, look at human specimens. And so I do have some pictures in there of the microRNA that's present in the immune cells that are actually surrounding uh, the cancer. Well, one of the surprises that we saw is that the gastric cancer itself, and so, you know, again, we don't know, you can't really follow the progression of the cancer. Um, the cancer is also expressed near 130B. 
Um, so you'll, uh, sorry, I didn't include that obviously because of time. Um, we also um, are looking at MIR 130B because it is secreted. It's present in the exosomes. Again, that's work that's in the gut paper. And so we actually looked at the serum of these um, patients with either gastric cancer, that's the China group and the Vietnamese group were biopsies of patients that had um, metaplasia. And we found that there was a correlation between uh, the uh, MIR 130B that is in the plasma or serum of the patients with um, the either metaplasia or um, cancer. So we are looking at this as a biomarker. Um, we're working with the Native American population. They don't like us to draw blood and things like that. And we're actually looking at um, the MIR 130B as a marker in urine. So we are able to even pick it up in urine. So anyway, I didn't have time to get too much into the um, human correlations. Um, I should also mention that the uh, Schlafen 4 does not exist in the human genome. The counterpart, the homolog, or it should be ortholog in humans is Schlafen 12L. Different Schlafen. Well, yeah. it, the, the uh, translational implications of all this work uh, could be tremendous, uh, you know, even beyond things like uh, Cialis and Viagra. <laughs> but, well, uh, and yeah. We're, we're actually um, setting up with the oncologist a clinical study to, to uh, treat patients uh, with stage one to three gastric cancer before they go to surgery with, um, we're going to use Cialis because it's uh, one pill a day. Incredible. I, I wish we had uh, time for more discussion and talk, but um, we're a little bit over and I'm sure that Mark would have been so pleased and proud. And uh, Juanita, thank you so much for giving an outstanding lecture this morning in memory of Mark. We're so thrilled that you joined us. Thank you. Thank you. It's such an honor. Great to see you. Thanks so thank much. Thank you, everyone, Bye, for attending. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Merchant.